All right, so today's topic, we're taking a look at the Transcontinental Railroad. And I don't know why, but I am absolutely fascinated by this. It's such an interesting process, and it was such a big deal. So let's jump right in and take a look. The Transcontinental Railroad uh, was something that Lincoln really, really wanted. In fact, he wasn't the only one. There were many, many others uh, that were really looking for a way to kind of link the East with the West. We're now, uh, thanks to the Mexican Cession and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, we are now a bicoastal nation. And uh, that is such an important thing for us economically. It means that we can now trade with, if, if we can link our markets up, uh, the East and the West, can trade back and forth in terms of natural resources and finished products. Ports on the east can trade with Europe and Africa. Ports in the west can trade with uh, Asia. And, and uh, there's basically no place in the world that's off limits to us. We can reach everybody. So what we're going to see is that Lincoln is going to pass what's called the Pacific Railway Act. He does this in 1862. Now, just like the Homestead Act, it's really interesting. He's, he's making big moves. This is in the middle of the Civil War. And so Lincoln is still governing a lot of times again. And as I said this in a previous video, uh, we tend to think that 1861 to 1865 is only all about the Civil War. But there were major moves being made by Lincoln uh, during this time as well. And uh, the Pacific Railway Act is one of the biggest. So he's going to sign this thing. Uh, but we have a problem. We're really short on money, and this is a major infrastructure project. It's what we would call today uh, kind of one of those shovel-ready projects, right? We, we've got to get this thing done, but it's big. This is a huge public works project. How do we pay for all this? Uh, because all of our money was being taken up by the fighting the Civil War and trying to win those battles, uh, we really don't have a lot of money to put towards other public works projects. So what we're going to see is that uh, he gets very creative and and funds the Transcontinental Railroad with a combination of government funds and land grants. Land might as well be the same as money because it represents opportunity. When you've got it, you can sell it, you can improve upon it, uh, and that's very, very appealing to many railroad companies. So that's what they offer. Uh, what it looks like is that for every mile of track laid, uh, these railroad companies get paid a certain amount of money. Now, uh, that amount of money may not cover all of their costs, but it's what gets them started. So uh, there's a tiered system here. Basically, if, if you're laying track in the plains where it's flat and easy to work with, uh, you get paid $16,000 per mile of track laid. If you're doing it in the foothills where uh, things aren't as flat, but it's not super steep, right? Uh, then now you can get paid $32,000 for every mile of track laid because the work is a little bit harder. You have to level some ground and work around some obstacles. But if you're working through the mountains where it's very steep, very rocky, very difficult terrain uh, to work with, you get paid $48,000 for every mile of track laid. Uh, that is a big incentive. But again, that's just the very beginning of it because the rest of, of what we're gonna see the government offer is in land. And uh, the land is very, very important here. So what it does is it gives a mile of, for every mile of track laid, companies receive land adjacent to the track. And I'm going to pull this up so you can see it a little bit better here. But the land grants for the railroads for 10 miles on either side of the track. So if this dotted black line is the railroad track, uh, then what they do is they alternate one square mile of the green spaces are one square mile of land that goes to the railroad companies. Next to that will be one square mile that remains within the government's ownership. And they alternate like that back and forth. And it does so for 10 miles on either side of the track. So we're talking about major, major land grants. Now the government is still gonna control the lion's share of the land. Uh, but railroad companies are going to do pretty well. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that once the land is in the, the hands of the railroad company, it instantly becomes more valuable because if you are close to a major railroad project, if you are tied to the rest of the nation uh, via this very important transportation network, it immediately improves the price of that land over, say, land that is 30 miles away or 40 miles away or 100 miles away. Uh, because it gives you access. It's an infrastructure project. 
They would also begin to build towns uh, in their areas that they controlled. Uh, doing that allowed them to begin to sell off some of the lands in order to create towns. As towns spring up along the, the already constructed portions of the railroad, then again, that land becomes even more valuable uh, because you're tied to civilization via the railroad and you're also close to towns and conveniences and, and those sorts of things. So the railroad companies made out like bandits on this. This was a very, very good deal for the railroad companies. And it was created as a very good deal for the railroad companies because they wanted to make the government wanted to make sure that this thing actually got done. And the best way is to offer incredible incentives. Now, it also had some teeth because if they didn't complete the railroad by a certain projected date, the railroad companies would be forced to give everything back. And so it would have ruined them. I mean, absolutely ruined them. I love this, though, because uh, the government says we want this done. We want it done in a certain amount of time. We're going to offer incredible incentives and payments to get it done. Uh, and there's going to be punishments if you don't, right? Uh, you have promised that you can do it. We're going to hold your feet to the fire. This is one of the smartest things that the government, I think, has ever done. So what we're going to see is that the railroad companies fund each phase of construction by selling off lands from the last phase of construction. And so in that way, not only are they able to fund the construction and pay their workers, but also begin immediately turning a profit. So this is a very important deal. They've got land. They begin to advertise. And I think you saw maybe, well, maybe not. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the idea of if you want a farm or a home, right? Railroad lands, Southwest Kansas. So they begin to advertise these great new lands uh, and that you, it's great soil and just all these really incredible benefits. Whoop, I'm in the wrong. There we go. Now, the, the federal government chooses two companies to create the Transcontinental Railroad uh, because they want it done and they want it done quickly because they know what a big boost this will be to the economy. Uh, they choose two companies. Now, one company is going to start in the east and it's going to work west. The other company is going to start in the west and work its way east and they should meet in the middle. So let's take a look here. The first company we're going to look in the east is called the Union Pacific Railroad. And uh, they began laying track from Omaha, Nebraska. Why Omaha? Well, because that was the furthest east track at the time. They didn't have to start on the east coast because all of the railroad already existed there. They simply had to tie it into the existing rail network. And that ended in Omaha. That's as far west as it had been created. Uh, now, the workers that were employed by the Union Pacific were often Civil War veterans. Uh, the, especially once the Civil War was over, there, had, there were a lot of men who were looking for an opportunity to start over, a lot of men looking for a new life. You also saw the same with Irish immigrants. Uh, there was a flood of Irish immigrants, and this represented opportunities for them to escape the cities, particularly places like New York and Boston, where they were stuck in really low-paying jobs and, and those sorts of things. This gave them the opportunity uh, to move out west while they were working and be the first ones that were there to maybe claim some homestead lands or buy cheap lands from the railroads. So a lot of Civil War vets, a lot of Irish immigrants, and they are going to lay a lot of track because in the east, we're starting off in the Great Plains. So the land is not, uh, it, it's very easy to lay track there. They don't get paid as much for laying track on the plains, right? $16,000 a, a mile but they can lay a lot of it. And the benefit, even though they're getting paid less, they're receiving a lot more in land grants. Now, the next railroad is called the Central Pacific, and it's going to start in the West. Uh, they're going to begin constructing from Sacramento, California. So this is going to tie California in once it's connected with New York and Boston and Philadelphia and St. Louis and Chicago and all the major ports and major cities and customer bases throughout the country. Uh, again, starting in the West. Now their customer, or their customer base, excuse me, their workforce was a little bit different. They had uh, prospectors and miners who had kind of given up or, or gone broke uh, and were looking for a way to, to sustain their, their lives. But you also saw a lot of Chinese immigrants, a lot of Chinese immigrants. 
there were a lot of folks who thought, well, they can't do this type of, of heavy work. Uh, they were reminded, though, that these are the same people who built the Great Wall of China. They can do pretty heavy work. Um, and so the Chinese are, are often going to work for maybe a little bit less. And that was very appealing to the Central Pacific Railroad owners at the time. Uh, and so large numbers of Chinese immigrants are put to work on the railroad, uh, a project that simply would not have been possible without their contributions. And oftentimes that's overlooked. Uh, so, in, and they were beginning in the West. So very, very quickly, they're going to run up against not the plains, but the mountains. So their progress was very, very slowed. There were times where the railroad company of the East, that Union Pacific, was laying miles and miles and miles of track every day. Uh, and there are times in the West where going through granite and mountains and trying to tunnel and, and have to engineer train trussels and bridges and so forth, so, so forth uh, that they were going feet, right, every day, right? And uh, so the going was very, very slow. You might think, well, Boy, that, that seems unfair, but the reality is they're getting paid much, much better, $48,000 a mile of track laid, and uh, they still get those land grants. Now, you can't farm the land. It's not as easy to sell the land to, to prospective farmers, but who is interested in the land are mining companies because in the mountains, you're going to find a lot of deposits of things like coal and, and possibly gold, silver, copper, you name it. There's a lot of mineral wealth uh, in those mountains and a lot of mining to be done. So, uh, so both companies made out incredibly well uh, with the land that they were given. Now, what we're going to see is that these companies uh, are going to join the tracks uh, at a place called Promontory Point. Because the federal government was paying them per track of mile laid, there was a point at which they overlapped. They saw each other. They, they could kind of wave at the distance almost and, and see the other train. And they just kept on laying ground, uh, kept on laying track, and kept on claiming more government money. The government does realize this at one point and forces them to tear those tracks up uh, and sets a point. You will meet at Promontory Point, Utah. And this is a very famous image of that day. You have the train company from the east, the train company from the west. Uh, you've got the owners of the company. You've got uh, construction workers and engineers and architects and uh, all of the people who are doing this work. Obviously not all of them, but many of them. Uh, we've got a guy with a bottle of champagne and another guy with a glass. This is a huge celebratory moment. Uh, in fact, it was uh, broadcast throughout the country at the time. So. Uh, we know exactly when the last spike was driven because this was something akin to putting a man on the moon. This is the, the lunar landing uh, for that time. It was such a major project, uh, such an engineering feat, uh, the world's first transcontinental railroad. A lot of people didn't even think this was possible. Uh, this was a major engineering effort. Here we can see one of the train trussels or, or bridges that was built over a ravine. They had to invent in order to get this done. They had to work through incredibly difficult uh, engineering problems. There were all sorts of things that they had to do to get this done. But once it's finished, once uh, train, it, it kind of acts as a time machine, it reduces the amount of time to travel from east to west, from one coast to the other, uh, reduces it from months and months to days. Uh, it took about four days to travel from the west coast to the east coast uh, via the trains. And so that is a big, big change. It's going to boost our economy. It's going to lower the price of goods. It's going to mean that more things are available. You cannot overstate the impact of something like the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, this was huge. So uh, anyway, again and again, I got ahead of myself there. This is the iron spine. This is now the backbone of the country in terms of the economy and uh and connecting us. You can now travel and, and experience new things. I love the Transcontinental Railroad. Absolutely fascinating. I encourage you to, to maybe research and learn a little bit more about it. Uh, but guys, I'm done for today. Thank you for watching. Be sure you subscribe. Uh, leave me any comments. I'd love to hear from you. But uh, for now, I'm done. Join me on the next one. Thanks, guys.